So please welcome. Can I have your can I have your attention, please? Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Goedenavond, dames en heren. Honored guests, again in the name of Bozar, I'm very sorry that we took a certain delay, but I think it was an opportunity to change the program and to see the project before the debate. So welcome to the opening of Imagine Europe in search of new narratives. Tonight I'm not welcoming you to a book presentation or the opening of an exhibition. Image in Europe is what I like to call a laboratorium. What you have seen and experienced today is the temporary result of a long-term process and a long-term collaboration between the Center for Fine Arts, the European Commission, and the artist community. Image in Europe is a part of the continuation of the pilot project, A New Narrative for Europe, that was initiated by the European Parliament in 2013 and which served as an exchange platform for artists, scientists, citizens, and policymakers. The next phase puts a strong emphasis on young people and on their involvement as European citizens. Students, schools, and universities participate actively in Imagine Europe, which projects such as Next Generation Please and Designing Democracy. Citizens' initiatives like Nuit Debout in Paris, Brussels, London, Reykjavik, Ghent, and other European cities prove that young people do feel involved and that they are longing for a more open democracy. What is Imagine Europe? Imagine Europe is a mix of debate and images. The central space is a discussion, discussion room in our Beaux-Arts street. It will be actively used for debates during the whole summer period until the end of September. In the other 12 rooms, you saw visual prop propositions of artists, designers, architects, and students who responded to our invitation and who show us their vision on contemporary European issues. The issues treated by the artists are quite imperative. Democracy, borders, refugees, industrialization and job creation, durability, the political duality in Europe between further integration in practice or disintegration. More Europe or more Euroscepticism. And the social fabric of our cities, the importance of public spaces. Tonight, tonight is a unique momentum because of the interesting mix of talented and intellectual individuals gathered here tonight. From architects, visual arts, scientists, writers, musicians, but also policymakers, citizens, and young people. With the inauguration of Image in Europe, we intend to transform the Center for Fine Arts tonight into an agora where citizens and many different backgrounds engage in a serious conversation about the future of Europe and our common challenges. Agora means 
public square in Greek, but this also means now in Portuguese. It's a certain that European agora has indeed become urgent. And before giving the floor to Jens Niemann Christensen, Deputy Direct General of the DGEAC, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the two parties involved in this project. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the European Commission, who acted as co-producer for the realization of this project in the framework of the preparatory action and new narrative for Europe, and more in particular to the Commissioner Tibor Navracic and the Director General of EAC, the Director General Mrs. Martin Reichertz and their teams. Our deepest gratitude also go to our main partner, the Bettelsmann Stiftung Brussels, whose support has proven to be vital for the realization of this project. We also value the contribution made by the Fonds Bayer Latour, and in particular for their next generation, please, and by the Evans Foundation for the overall Image Europe Imagine Europe project. This project is a part of the artistic program for the, from the Center for Fine Arts, present in the framework of the new narrative for Europe. And also the Netherlands presidency of the Council of the European Union. I would like to thank the Ambassador van der Neuvel and her team at the Embassy of the Netherlands, and Missy, Mrs. Mario van Schaik, Intendant of the European by People program for the intense collaboration these last few months. Finally, a warm congratulations is in order for the people at the Center for Foreign Arts who have contributed to the realization of this project. First and foremost, to Kathleen Weitz for the overall coordination, but also to Evan Strauen, Frederick Muse, and Kurt de Boot for the valued contribution and the production team of Bozar for their support. Thank you. Please, Jens. Good evening. Thank you, Paul. It's a great honor for me to be here tonight on behalf of the European Commission to be part of the opening of this journey this new project that we, the European Commission, with Bozar, is uh, planning for the next few months. Now, uh, Paul was kind enough to introduce me as an official of the European Commission. And of those of you who have started to go through the labs, uh, I just want to say that somewhere in one of the first rooms, you hear from Ingo Niemann, who you will also meet in a minute or two, that I may be uh, one of those that he describes as the Europeans who are reigned by imbecile bureaucrats. I hope you don't take it literally. I didn't. I found it inspirational to just uh, to say that it's fun and it's interesting. And when you go through these labs, I hope you will find it as inspiring as I have found it. It is amazing to see how you can open your mind and have new perspectives to the narrative for Europe. Because there is a quote saying, aren't there any new narratives inspiring young generations of Europeans within and beyond the EU at the beginning of the 21st century? And if there are any, where are they emerging from and who is willing to tell them? This is a quote from Odi Chenal in her essay, Continent of Broken Dreams. And it raises questions that are more topical than ever before, in my opinion. Europe is facing today much more than an economic or political crisis or a migration crisis. We know that, and Europe is struggling to come to grips with it, but also to find answers to these challenges which are of historic proportions. But behind that, and perhaps above that, Europe's confronted with the crisis of identity. The disorientation felt by Hmong, many young Europeans, is currently being exploited by arising narratives filled with hate currently and against all the values we stand for. The fact that Europe is built on cultural and religious diversity and that we want to stand for a way of life that is not exclusive, but is an inclusive society for everybody who lives here. 
This is the Europe we dream of, and this is Europe we will never get. Let's face it, this is a journey that will go on forever. The battle will go on, but we fight to reach that dream. We will keep on striving, and we will never give up. But what are there for, and this is what this project is about, the counter-narrative, a narrative of hope, a narrative of reaching young people and asking them to simply uh, take Europe forward and shape the Europe that's going to be the Europe for their future, where they're going to spend the rest of their lives. Our European narrative was born in response to a call by former president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, following a proposal from the European Parliament. And it was clearly a wish for a stronger and more open European debate. The project was originally meant to involve artists, scientists, writers, and thinkers across Europe in a discussion about Europe, and in effect, try to reconnect European project with its citizens. Now, two years ago, a group of prominent cultural figures unveiled a declaration called The Mind and Body of Europe, the essence of several debates with senior policymakers across Europe, such as Angela Merkel and Donald Tusk. But the project cannot and could not limit itself to a few debates and this publication. So we have to widen the circle of participants, and this is why we are here tonight. Two months ago, the second stage of the new narrative for Europe was launched by my commissioner, Tibor Navratic, together with the ambassadors, where Paul was already one of the first original members of the Cultural Committee and now is an ambassador for the debate about new narrative for Europe. And this is really a debate that we need to take forward from today. We built on the ideas of a long-term dialogue by making the new narrative work as a plucking model adaptable to the variety of formats and events, including youth debates in as many, a large majority of our member states in exhibitions, festivals, and activities like this one. The goal is to broaden the debate, to make it inclusive, to reach out so possibly as many Europeans as possible can participate, and in particular, young Europeans. Youth is the future of Europe. It is their future that is most uncertain today. They have been hit disproportionately by the economic crisis, and this young generation is on the whole more educated and better informed and connected than any previous generation. But more and more young people struggle to see the European project as their project and to see Europe as theirs. Still, it's our experience from the beginning of this effort that young people have many opinions and wish to share them with us in their own ways. So this is where, for instance, social media come in, which is another dimension of our new narrative for Europe debate to try to reconnect Europe with European youth. We have merged our um, forces with the Center for Fine Arts, Bazaar, for this joint activity that we are going to open tonight. And why Bazaar? Bazaar has been creating a dialogue for a long time between artists and politics. It succeeded in developing an agora to initiate debates between citizens, the arts, and decision makers. And for this reason, on behalf of the European Commission, I'm particularly glad that the second phase of the New Narrative Europe project will have as one of its flagship events here with Bazaar. But I'm still looking forward to you, because tonight you will hear a debate about key important uh, opinion formers, and we hope that you will find it interesting. But ultimately, it has to be a debate between you and by you. You have to go home tonight and wish to engage. Europe is more than just bureaucrats. It's not just office buildings. It's not just politicians. It's your future. You can shape Europe if you want to take up the debate and start dreaming about what kind of Europe you would like to see in 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. This is the challenge we give to you tonight, that not only have you been kind enough to come and share an evening with us and have, I'm sure, a little bit of a visit of the very, very interesting exhibition and activities you will have in the different labs, but ultimately, you need to give the answer. It's not going to come from me as an official. It's not going to come from the politicians. It's not going to come from, I will allow me to say that, there are a few around, people of a higher age than 35 or 40, because it is your future, and you can shape Europe if you want to. So what we have seen in Molenbeek, what we saw in the airport, and in the station in, in the metro, or what we saw in Paris and in Copenhagen, is part of what we experience right now, a society which is exclusive, which doesn't reach everybody, and where there are people living here who do not feel they belong. I'm sure we all want to sign up to the fact that Europe is a place for all of us, and we want to share this future together, and therefore you need to shape that future, you need to shape that Europe, 
and I, we really challenge you to do so. And this is the beginning tonight. Thank you for coming. Anna, Anna Lurton, our mistress of ceremony for tonight, will be introducing to you in a minute the debate with our distinguished guests um, and uh, present them to you as well. But before doing so, due to the unforeseen circumstances, I've been announcing you earlier before of Ozark Henry not being able to be with us because he is in the hospital right now. We will just show you a short movie on his work. It will only take a minute before Anna Lurton will come and introduce the guests. Thank you and enjoy your evening. I hope that Europa is a continent that is without borders, and a continent that enkel its value as borders. Neemt. De continent nog altijd innoveert, maar um, met de mens centraal. Um, de continent nog altijd uh, vooruit ziet. Maar enkel als het rekening houdt met iedereen die er is. Um, en iedereen die er is, zoals hij, bestaat met respect voor zijn identiteit. Een continent dat uh, waarschijnlijk zal gedigitaliseerd zijn. Geautomatiseerd. Heel leefbaar. And heel bereikbaar. Iets goed daar. Human dignity. Future, hope. And here we are in Brussels in the wake of the Brussels attacks. This evening is a moment of reflection of debate of conversation about the future. We have extremism, we have terrorism, Europe is thinking the in unthinkable, what happens if the Eurozone splits? Today, tear gas has been fired at migrants after they try to scale a border fence at the Greek border. There is fear and desperation, but there is hope and people stay proud. And there is a rescue team. This rescue team is you, and this rescue team is the special team of tonight. They think, they do, they make. I'm very happy to introduce you to Rem Kohlhaas, Sincere's architect of houses and ideas and plans for today and for tomorrow. I'm happy to introduce you to Ingo Nierman, a writer, a novelist and artist. He is a cultural designer and editor of Solution Books, a collection of ideas aimed at improving the lives of many people, citizens all over the world. And the third person is Ivana Abramovic, a scientist specialized in nuclear fusion. I give them the floor now. So we're happy that you made it, that we are here all together. A question for the three of you. The title of the evening is, and of the lab is, Imagine Europe. But it has, one could say, hard to become imaginative about Europe. Maybe the reality is too hard or too unbelievable. Is Europe a question of imagination? 
you can Reb, is Europe a question of imagination? Um, what, what I want to kind of represent tonight is uh, maybe uh, a voice which is not dealing in metaphors or in too overt uh, rhetoric, uh, but a voice which is kind of maybe um, trying to look uh, in a almost clinical way at the way kind of Europe now performs. And I think there are many things to say about Europe uh, and very direct ways of, uh, to say about Europe that don't necessarily need imagination. And because I think the more we uh, cloak Europe in kind of rhetorical language, metaphorical language, uh, the more we mention crisis, the more we remove ourselves from a, a precise vision of what Europe is. So I try to maintain that position during the evening. Precise. Ingo, uh, also, people saw your work already. Uh, in fact, you make Europe, you make stories of Europe visible. You tell them, you show something. I mean, uh, I, I must admit, I don't really understand the question because, of course, Europe is there, so you don't have to imagine it. Um, and it's a title, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, c um, I don't... Um, still, uh, it's, uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the problem a bit, what you really want. Um, and... It started when, when I was approached, it was about narratives, and now it was, and then it was turned into imagining Europe. And I was, I was really wondering why, uh, why, what happened to the new narratives, why it's now imagining Europe. What happened here? What does it mean? And I, I must admit, I don't understand. Because uh, with the new narratives, I completely understood. It's about, um, with, I think imagining is new narratives already has a vagueness, but imagining Europe, uh, it's it's so vague that it's hard to relate to it. It's real enough, you mean? Yeah. 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 Ivana, is Europe real enough for you? Well, I'd like to first go back to the title. So the title is Imagine Europe, and what I, as a scientist, always think about is the future. So you can think about Europe as this concept of a future world. So do you think about the future? And what kind of future do you see? And what can you do today to make it happen? And often people in my field have been accused of being visionaries and trying to do things that are hard to accomplish, but still you try to do them every day. And I think with Europe as a more abstract concept, it's the same thing. So if it is a world like without borders, for example, we can, we can talk about that and how to make that happen. But really, if we look at technology, we are already doing that. It's just not there yet because we have the internet, for example. And I think all the social issues that exist in the real world, they don't really exist that much in the virtual world. So we should try to, to pay attention to the power that we already have and we don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rem, you uh, present here in Bozar the replica of the office of Juncker, uh, the president of the European Commission, maybe you already saw it. Uh, is this our, uh, a kind of answer for our need to uh, see something very concrete of this Europe? It's very yeah, human yes, Europe. It is uh, at the same time uh, uh, an attempt at realism uh, and an attempt at uh, demystification. Uh, I think that Europe uh, only has one s a very serious issue and problem, and that problem is the fact that uh, altogether the leaders of Europe are Europe. Brussels is the combination of all the leaders of Europe. And the kind of problem is that almost any European leader, uh, when they stand in front of their own parliaments, they use Brussels as an abstraction uh, and 
use Brussels as uh, an apparent force that is imposing on them things that they would not necessarily li like, but that somehow have to execute. And I think that this essential dishonesty where Brussels is used uh, as an ent entirely negative factor uh, and as an alibi for those parts of the European leadership obligations that they do not like to confess to or uh, uh, live with, uh, I think that that is the problem of Europe. So if what I would, in, what, what I would love to do, for instance, is a, write a speech for the Dutch prime minister and say, listen, this is the kind of reality, this is how it works, nobody has to be embarrassed about it, it's very simple, small things we decide here and big things we decide there, we are we, it's not an other force, and so therefore live with it and kind of don't stay in this kind of permanent kind of schizophrenic state of uh, suspense uh, about what the kind of situation is. How real is this replica? I mean, I saw in the library of Juncker, very nice books. Uh, um, uh, there was uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, um, Ule Beck, but also Johan Cruyff. Is he reading Johan Cruyff? Uh, I think he's a reader uh, and uh, he's a European, so uh, I assume it's not impossible uh -huh. that he's reading uh, Johan Cruyff. Okay, <laughs> it's not impossible. Now, uh, going from books to narratives, in search of new narratives, that's the undertitle. What kind of narratives do we need? Are the old narratives not good enough anymore or, or they're not powerful enough? Do we need always new narratives? Ingo. Um, <coughs> Europe had, had two narratives for decades and they worked extremely well. Uh, one is the idealistic one that uh, <coughs> it's, always, it's about the future, something that is about to come that will probably never fulfill completely, but that's something that we can try to accomplish. And if we felt now, then we will do better and we will get closer to it. And that is something where Europe is a role model for the whole world. Europe will make something happen as um, a super nation and which will eventually become a, a world state, a world government, and Europe is just the first step. The other one is the technocratic one. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, Europe has great non-corrupt non uh, bureaucrats uh, who, who do things a bit more smoothly than, um, than, than, than parliaments. Um, <clears throat> and these, these two narratives work perfectly well, as especially in, in this combination that you could always switch from one to another. And, uh, and uh, the national governments led Europe in this, in this realm of these two narratives, never tested them because in concrete way they could always be a scapegoat, but, but still they had these narratives. Um, and now we are confronted, first time it started with the economic crisis, with the debt crisis, now with the refugee crisis, that these narratives don't work anymore as well the idea of expansion, of, of territorial expansion, doesn't work anymore. Um, uh, Euro Europe has been confronted first in Georgia, uh, then in the Ukraine, uh, that, that, there's, uh, that there's an enemy. Yeah, they cannot just confront into, uh, into like terra incognita. There's, uh, there's other powers. Um, and so, of course, yeah, uh, Europe needs new narratives. I think so. Um, do, uh, does Europe need really new narratives? Because one could say, okay, there were old political narratives, uh, also the narratives of European justice. Maybe that's very important. Once one can say also there is a, a kind of uh, erosion of this old political, juridical narrative of human rights, equality. Um, it seems that we are going to a fortress uh, Europe, like you said, um, do we n really need new narratives or do we have to make the old ones, the ones of the beginning, more stronger? Um, 
I think that uh, we should stop can I perhaps for a moment to look at Europe, because what, what you see is that you could say, uh, of course, Europe needs uh, new narratives because the world needs new narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, we are living in a kind of absurdly turbulent world with uh, absurd risks and absurd um, turmoil uh, permanently of, of many different kinds. And I think that uh, Europe is uh, trying to kind of, is in a doomed but also embarked on a kind of process of permanent improvisation. And if you look at it, maybe not as uh, a kind of super state that is inconsistent uh, or a super state that is unable to live according to its values. But if you look at it as a group of nations that is basically navigating this storm with more or less uh, success, and uh, so far not uh, a kind of really uh, unbelievable uh, accident, then it becomes kind of more understandable and also I think more more natural. Uh, and I think that is really crucial. And, and um, Inga was saying that in many ways, if you step out of Europe, you see how the European condition is not, you know, an identity crisis, but uh, on the contrary, uh, uh, a territory which is not necessarily only an old territory, but uh, a, a very young territory that is dealing with uh, completely new givens and new conditions and doing it with uh, a certain elan. Ivana, uh, how you f do you feel these new narratives? Uh, you spoke already about the importance of imagination to make something work better. Uh, to improve something, to improve also thoughts. Um, how important are narratives for you? I think I would agree that the world needs new narratives mm -hmm. in general because this, in my field, if you ask me personally, it is a way that you express things and you think within certain boundaries. And if you're stuck with them and you just stick with one thing, there is no way you can make something really new. You cannot make an innovation. You cannot make a discovery. So new narratives are always a must. And especially, I think, also in the political context of Europe and the world um, in general. But in my field, this is crucial because we have our own language, basically, in which we think. And this is very limiting. And that is a problem. But that is something that in science, for centuries it has been done. In science, you always look for the new narrative. It's sort of, it's what you do. It's your job. This is your job, Ingo, in the solution books. One of them was called the Great Pyramid. Um, and when you asked Rem Kolhas to cooperate uh, um, in, in this uh, uh, solution book, um, he uh, you said you say, say some somewhere in the exhibition he ha his or in the book his hand started to tremble uh, because solution is a word he never used. I come back to that, but you wanted to use it. Why? Uh, because nowadays it's it's mainly in, in used in the sphere of economics uh, and and technology so that we always speak about techno uh, technological solutions. Uh, I, I observe how many companies in the world exist that have solution in the title, it's, it's amazing. Um, and, uh, but, so I thought it, it would be really daring to uh, reclaim it for, um, yeah, kind of for the world of, uh, of literature and, um, <coughs> Or, uh, yeah, for for the rest of the culture, and um, the great thing with solutions is um, that they can you that you try to come up with solutions, and in the end you might even think, oh, the problem was not really the problem. So actually, the pro uh, the way I I formulated the problem might be the actual problem and uh, this problem doesn't really exist. Uh, for years and years I heard that unemployment is the biggest problem in our society. Yeah, it, I heard it for decades and decades. And then you come up 
oh, actually, we can solve the problem of unemployment. It is possible. And so, look here, there is ways of doing it. But then the question is, do we find these solutions that really would work so compelling? So maybe there's another problem. There's a, pro a general problem with work and so on. And that's, uh, that's the whole uh, approach of this, of this series. It's very playful. It's, uh, it's saying, okay, this is, let's say, this is a problem. I'm, I'm offering you a bunch of solutions. And then we can go on. Mm -hmm. Rem, why don't you like the words solutions? Uh, or you never use it? Uh, I, I like the word uh, the word uh, solutions incredibly much, but uh, I, in a way it was a kind of issue of timidity, and and uh, so for the moment that I knew somebody who would use the word without inhibitions, I, I really became an admirer uh, and um, was extremely excited by kind of rethinking about that uh, word, and. Maybe that kind of experience itself kind of shows how uh, how deeply ingrained our cynicism is and uh, our lack of confidence, uh, and and how almost like uh, from Munchausen's uh, we have we have to pull ourselves away from you know from modesty or away from um, a kind of sense of uh, impotence and kind of project uh, a much more. Uh, solution-driven uh, uh, um, uh, direction, uh, and, and of course that needs in itself imagination. There is a solution for the problem with the sound. You have to turn your mobiles off, all of you. It's true. Uh, uh, it's in the pe people are beginning to leave. <laughs> uh, Ivana, <laughs> going from Maybe solution, the word solution yeah, they need yeah. their phone. <laughs> <laughs> Protest. Uh. Ivana, uh, we were talking about solutions. Uh, your key problem or key uh, interest is energy. Maybe I think it's the, the key uh, problem of all of us. We need this energy, we need this flux. But you wrote as a student, you studied in Eindhoven, uh, the notion of energy was intriguing for you since you were a child. Um, in fact, being curious about what energy is and how it is produced, I think we all have I'm this. I'm still curious about that. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm You're still, still curi curious. Uh, you specialized, you specialized in fusion, working with extremes. Uh, fusion is working with extremity of uh, heat, much a lot of extremes. Is there a link between thinking in fusion and thinking about the future of Europe? Of Europe and of the world. Yeah. That's uh, the world. what I tried to say in the beginning. So it's literally my job. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's um, the fusion as you may or may not know, does not work yet, but we're working very hard on making it work because it is a good option and it solves the energy crisis. Um, but to do this, as you mentioned, there are many extreme conditions that have to be dealt with, and that's the problem, that's the puzzle of fusion. So right now, if uh, somebody would have to single out the most um, largest uh, obstacle standing in fusion's way, it would be materials because they simply cannot take the particle flux and the heat flux that uh, a reactor should take. So this is one of the things we're looking into, but each day when you face a problem that you know it is not solved yet, and many people who you may consider smarter than yourself have tried solving it um, and failed before you, then you really have to kind of hold on to that vision of the world that you want to create, because that's what you're, what's you're, what you're doing at the moment. You don't really know if you will see your invention been made and uh, be useful to other people, but you just have this picture in your mind and you hold on to it, which is, I think, um, we should practice in, in all fields, not only in science. It's also in architecture, it's also in literature, in everything. Yeah, of course, like anything that involves creativity, which is a very important thing. Uh, to make any breakthrough, you have to be creative, and the gap between what you can learn in class or from books and between the act of discovery, it's, it's still large. It's, it's 
kind of artistic uh, mm -hmm. gesture in science. Mm -hmm. by, by sheer coincidence, um, as part of a, a, a kind of Harvard research project, we visited the kind of institute where, where this uh, is being pursued uh, three weeks ago. And uh, it is kind of really an, an unbelievably uh, impressive compression of European intelligence uh, that is collected there. And, and also being there, there, there was a, a huge sense of relief that this might be possible eventually or even imminent. And, and how in a perfectly innocent European countryside an institute like that is functioning and is kind of working on uh, an incredible future component of our future. So uh, again, it it shows how uh, premature the the kind of sense of crisis is, or maybe how wrong the sense of crisis is. Mm -hmm. We are talking about crises now, um, but uh, Rem, you were born in 44, 1944, so just before the end of the war, as a child, you saw the ruins of, uh, you, you grew up in the ruins of war, of a, uh, a broken Europe. Um, did this had, had this influence on your thinking about cosmopolitanism or Europeanism? <laughs> um, no, it had, uh, it had an influence on my optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, That's cosmopolitanism, uh, maybe. Because I, I basically, kind of, as a child, I saw kind of uh, in five years uh, a disaster situation turn into a kind of totally reasonable situation. So I experienced, in the most graphic sense, uh, a drastic sense of um, improvement, as almost kind of no generation since. Uh, 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 whatever I felt, so so that that was really critical. So not not the drama, but the the solution to the drama was was actually the the most interesting thing. And then I had the luck to uh, live in a different continent, uh, and of course that gave me also an advantage of not being a European, but not uh, only from, Euro from the European point of view, but being able to identify uh, very easily with uh, a an, an point of view outside Europe. Yeah, you went to Indonesia with your father, who was director mm. there in a cultural mm. institute. Mm. So you, you, you became very quickly a cosmopolitan. A cosmopolitan is a very European kind of word, mm -hmm. uh, and and I doubt I became that. I became uh, an Asian, mm -hmm. and I think that that is an important distinction. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the uh, distinction uh, that's that's important that you tell us? Well, well, that you are not uh, a, a kind of new cultural construct, but that you uh, understand. Uh, for instance, that there are other kind of positions, but but from the inside. Uh, so it's not a kind of idealistic construction. But yes, I know how it feel, how a uh, Muslim uh, world feels, mm -hmm. and and I know the kind of beautiful quietness of it, and I know the calmness of it, yeah? and and th those are words that are probably uh, not recently applied to uh, an Islamic world, but uh, it's still a very strong experience. Mm. Ivana, uh, you're the youngest here. It's Ivana's birthday. She becomes 27 today. Um. <laughs> yes. Thank you. But Ivana, you are also the one who experienced war in uh, Serbia, you were a refugee. Uh, you had to, uh, as you were nine when you had to? I was nine going 10, and so that was 1999, mm. uh, basically by the end of the war. So y you experienced a long time in this war, and then you had to uh, um, be in a refugee camp, or how did you do this? Well, <sighs> It's difficult for me to answer the question because I don't feel I really have the right to talk about this because my experience of it was more an adventure, whereas I know that there are people who had uh, really a hard time during these few years. But 
in my experience, I just went on a road trip with my father, and I went to Amsterdam because my aunt lived there. Abrina. So uh, we basically just moved, uh, moved in with her. But in your lifetime, you had three passports, Yugoslavia, uh, Serbia Montenegro, Serbian passport. Yes. You're only 27. Yes, it's strange. Uh, it's a country where you can uh, stay at one place and still change three countries <laughs> over mm. 10 years. Do you feel uh, Europe, or the, no, let's say Europe now in a different way? I, I can imagine that you feel the difference between someone of 27 from Belgium and someone of 27 who experienced war and uh, um, bombs and uh, everything uh, from Serbia? Well, I think it's just the difference that maybe people who have experienced war and uh, have maybe moved away because of this, they, they have a more mature view of, of Europe and of the world in general because they have uh, these things were their reality and it wasn't something that they saw in the news. But apart from that, I mean, we all listen to similar music and do similar mm -hmm. things. What is this mature view on Europe then? What, what is, is this more mature view? The more mature view? Yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, it, I think it's just if you add 20 years. So it would be a view of a person who is 45 or 47 uh, in, in comparison to somebody who is 20 and 27. Mm. It's just you look at it in a different way. Ingo, you grew up in Germany. Uh, that's also a very specific country. You uh, moved for a while to the former East Berlin. Uh, you lived there for a while. Uh, when I'm correct, uh, how important was it to, for you to have this personal experience of living in a nation as Germany? Um, <coughs> um, I, I, w I was happy. I mean, the, the, wall, the wall came down and then I moved right away to the east and there was still, so there was still uh, patrols. I sh still had to show my passport and so on. I was illegally living in East, east, east Berlin which was a strange situation. Um, so that was interesting, uh, but really as well an adventure because you, and quite predictable and, uh, adventure because you already knew that it would end very soon. What I think, I, I would love to come back to the narratives mm -hmm. quickly and why I insisted on, I, on yes, narratives. Okay. Yeah, can I? Of course, um, I wanted to come back because, to it. Because, um, <coughs> The thing with, with narratives, and I insist because I'm foremost a writer, is um, you can skip time. You can describe things that actually happen really fast and on, on many, many pages, uh, and then you can, you can skip. And uh, the, a problem, I think, is as well this different speed of things, as Rem described after, after Second World War. I mean, the complete disaster, and then, Within a few years, everything is so much better. And, and I'm, I'm sure in Serbia, in a way, the situation is worse. It, you, you, things are going on really fast. And then you have a situation like um, the economic crisis hitting in. In, uh, in 2008, it all started. And now it's already, we are already, it's already eight years, yeah? And uh, almost eight years. And, uh, and we're still dealing with it. We still don't know if it's over. So. Um, and it's not even always for some people it's very dramatic, but for some other people they even uh, they lose sight of it, and that's always a problem with narratives. That you, um, how do you do a compelling narrative when when that is related to real life and that is not just mm -hmm. fiction, um, that that can deal with things that take so much time. Same with fusion energy. I mean, I remember when I grew up when I was a child. This was this was the new hope. Uh, it mm -hmm. was so close, and then I completely forgot about it. I, I, no one thought. And suddenly you hear this great news. Oh, actually, it seems to work. And 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 this is uh, uh, you know this is things we have to deal with. Is this the patience we need? I think in narratives too, maybe. I think it would be interesting to. Uh, of course, you can always say patient, be be more patient, be more patient. Sure, uh, but where where do you get all this patience? 
patients from. So mm -hmm. you have to think of a solution, a way how to get patient. Mm -hmm. You cannot just say, be more patient. So you need a narrative that makes you patient. You know, so you have just mm -hmm. one step further, but... Maybe bureaucracy is, this, is such a kind of narrative. Uh, Rem, you once uh, said that uh, we have to uh, be proud of this expertise of negotiations and agreements uh, that uh, is building Europe. So maybe we have to be proud of this bureaucracy or may what some people call political inertia. Um, there's, there's nothing kind of really interesting I can say about uh, bureaucracy. Uh, but but maybe uh, maybe that is its uh, a great quality. Uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, force that uh, continues, uh, that is used to kind of opposition, used to kind of problems, used to either address or circumvent problems. But anyway, it's in a kind of very consistent uh, force and a very consistent uh, commitment that if you're really honest, it makes many, many things work. Your work is probably partly the result of bureaucracy. My result work is highly dependent on bureaucracy. So it's one of these kind of weird uh, categories that we've all agreed to uh, detest, uh, even while we all depend uh, completely on it. And, and that was in the, the motivation of uh, reconstructing Juncker's room, because you, know, you see the incredible modesty and, and commitment that must be necessary to live in those kind of circumstances in, in, in this constant kind of pressure and, and addressing all these really serious issues, but at least addressing them. What kind of European citizens do we need? Do we need um, engaged citizens? Do we need uh, more cosmopolitan European citizens? More? Do we need more hospitality? What people do we need around us when we are imagining Europe or in, new, in our new narratives? I, I think this is a horrible question okay. because uh, the, the people are given. You cannot just decide, oh, we need this kind of people. And what we do with the rest of the people, we, we kick them out or... Uh, mm. yeah. <clears throat> and, and I think that is the problem with a lot of, of narratives and with moralism. I mean, we, we have to, to start where we are. And, um, uh, uh, and when, when people are, for instance, when there is a lot of xenophobia, we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. If we just say, okay, all the, okay, we can say, and then come to solution, we can say, all the xenophobic people go to this side, and the non-xenophobic people, please, to this side. We can actually do this. It's possible. So we can say we, go, we deal only with the people that we like. But then we have to offer something to the people who we don't like, because other Otherwise, we end up with something that Germany already experienced, mm -hmm. yeah? And, and we might be now think we are more righteous, and we know what is good and what is bad. Uh, but, uh, I mean, so you, you have to be very, very, I think, respectful to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we can do this. It's a scenario. It's a scenario that is, I think, something that we should think about. Maybe we need more segregation. We can think about it. When there's certain people who don't like to live with, with people from different nationalities, then maybe they have to create, we have to create a kind of world for them that is pure, but it's only a tiny little world and there they can go and be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But what's still existing? Yeah. Of course, of course. You know, it's, but, but it's, it's, it's a solution. And then you can say, no, I don't like this solution. Mm -hmm. yeah? but, but give me a better one. And I, I think segregation is not per se such a bad thing for, for many kinds of things. For, uh, you know, being, why, why now we are all squeezed in, in, in urban situations that get more and more expensive. For instance, the creative class, artists, they all live in, the, in those exciting cities and they pay a high, high, high price. So 
why not go what people did in the past, build their enclave in some more suburban situation that is much more affordable, you know, you can and, and, and live a better life, do a bit of agriculture, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is telecommunication, there is the internet, there is no reason why we all have to, to stick together. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no reason why we all have to stick together. Rem, that brings me to your Delirious New York, uh, a book that you wrote in the 70s. Uh, it was a kind of manifesto, in fact. Um, can you write this kind of manifesto of the Europe that we have now? Um, I, I really don't know. But, but also I'm not really inclined to do it because um, at the time I thought the word uh, manifesto was kind of really dated uh, and therefore I included uh, a subtitle which said a retroactive manifesto for New York. So it's not really a manifesto for how things should be, it's an explanation in retrospect of what actually happened in New York. And um, I think you would be a fool to write a manifesto now with all these uh, uncertainties, all this turmoil uh, about how uh, Europe should be. But uh, yes, I do think that there is a lot of explanation that you can provide uh, that will uh, make Europe more palatable and more transparent uh, uh, to its own citizens and therefore uh, a lot more exciting as a project, as an ongoing project. But maybe actually just conversations and debates should be something more of a, on a regular basis because by this you increase communication among mm -hmm. people and if you change the way people communicate then uh, you can just help this process of evolution that simply they stop to be bothered by some things that there's no reason to be bothered by. So what was happening always in history, artists, uh, uh, people, uh, mothers, fathers, children, teachers, intellectuals, talking with each other, seeing each other in their daily life. Is this maybe also something important, not only to imagine Europe, but also to be aware of um, what daily life is, what we, how we behave to each other, just simple, uh, normal things, uh, like small gest gest gestures, not only new narratives. Maybe we need this, if we need something. Uh, uh, normal life. Yeah, so, so great, again, but how, how do we create this? You can't uh, create it, we, but you, no, you there can, can be you a can, necessity. You can, you can. Uh, what f was for me much more impressive than actually moving to, to East Berlin was moving to, to Beijing in 2005 for half a year. Uh, because what I counted was that uh, there was so much community life. People were meeting each other in the parks in the evening. They were hanging out. They were chatting with other. They were doing gymnastics. They were dancing, everything. And it had a very, very simple reason. There was no... Uh, no, no one had like private cars uh, to, to uh, and they were living in really small flats. So of course they would go out and share. They, they would go, so you have to, but in Europe we are living in a situation, for instance now you're experiencing the, the reason why uh, real estate prices are going so up, so extremely up, like in a town in Berlin, the population is not growing that fast. It's because people want more space space where they actually hide from each other. So uh, you have to, you, you could of course say, okay, no one is allowed to have more than 50 square meter. And then you will see people will, uh, community life on the streets will, will be activated, I'm sure. I see the architects laughing. <laughs> Rem? Can you? I, I totally agree, yeah, so. Mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> huh? Ivana, 
you wanted with your science, you really wanted to contribute. Uh, it's not a small gesture what you are doing. It, like neither of uh, like Rem is also doing a lot. Uh, you know, you too. Uh, the importance for you to take your responsibility was it always there? Uh, well, yes. For me, it was always there, but. Um, in general, my colleagues, we all feel this responsibility because we think that what we're doing is important. And it's a very international community. So it's sometimes when I hear people talking about the issues we just discussed, for us, it's not like that. That's not our reality. We have very close and very open communication. It doesn't matter where you come from. It just matters that we're working on the same thing towards the same goal. Ingo, what's your responsibility? Uh, my responsibility? Um, f the first one is n uh, not, not, not to harm other people. Yeah? I, I have a very, very con conservative approach to this. That's the, that's the first thing. And when I, for instance, spoke, okay, the xenophobic people go to that side, the others to go to that side, I don't think, you know, the the f the, the horrible, most horrible thing for me is really is violence. And I saw these images today as well, and I once was in a situation where I uh, uh, got in contact with, with tear gas. It was not in Europe. Uh, and, and I mean, this is, I'm, I'm really surprised that this is legal because this is a chemical weapon. Yeah, and, and you, it makes you panic. Uh, you, you feel, you, you're afraid that you would die, that you can die, you cannot breathe anymore, and many people actually who have serious heart conditions can die from this. It's, uh, I don't know if the European tear gas is now somehow more improved than, than the Egyptian one, that's the one I, I experienced, but I don't think so. And uh, this is for me really, really horrible. Yeah? Um. <clears throat> And, yeah. Uh, Rem, what's your responsibility? Um, well, <clears throat> I, I don't have the luxury of being in a, in a profession where the kind of responsibility is so unquestionable. And also not the luxury of being in a profession where the uh, damage you can inflict is uh, uh, minor. Uh, y uh, but. Uh, therefore, I'm in a kind of profession where actually you have huge responsibilities that are imposed on you and that you have to work with in a kind of, in a way where you maintain uh, a degree of imagination uh, in uh, an otherwise quite risk averse uh, uh, situation. And uh, what I try to do kind of personally is to uh, find a sequence of uh, involvements that uh, occurs when either nations are trying to redefine themselves or trying to come to terms with modernity or are trying to transform from one condition uh, into another condition. So uh, to the extent that I've been able to, I've been kind of looking for those conditions that you can exercise the huge responsibilities, but in a kind of meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take your responsibility now and always. Thank you.